there's been a number of allegations implicating Deputy President Paul Mashatile, and these include his relations with personalities that have been implicated in state capture, such as Edwin Sodi, for one. Now, currently, Gauteng MEC Lebuhang Maile has also instructed an investigation on a matter that involves a 37 million rand property allegedly bought by Mashatile's son-in-law, uh, which is registered on a 99-year lease uh, to legacy properties. Now, it was first Further revealed that the son-in-law received loans from the Gauteng Partnership Fund of at least 30 million rand to build student accommodation that never materialized. ANC Secretary General Figile Mbalula says that there is a political campaign against Mashatile and these are stories without evidence, while Mashatile himself says that there is a plot to oust him. Now, as we continue on the subject of leadership in the country, we are joined this morning virtually uh, by economist uh, or rather economic activist, Mandi Samashiko, and director of the Conscious Leadership Academy, Guru Kali. Uh, Mandi Sir, Guru Kali, thanks to both of you for joining us. Welcome to Morning Live. And I just want to start uh, with you, Mandi Sir, just looking at these allegations, uh, what has surfaced so far around the Deputy President, Paul Mashatile. Should South Africans be concerned about what we are seeing and hearing? Good morning and good morning to all um, viewers of Morning Live. Of course, South Africans shouldn't be concerned. South Africans are deeply, deeply concerned. Um, we are generally insecure as South Africans because we exist in a kleptocratic society wherein um, we have very few people in the state and I include government in that um, uh, um, uh, scoping. We have very, very few individuals, if any really, that we can have confidence in. And I'm not referring only to um, politically appointed or deployed individuals. That is all senior executives like directors, generals, CEOs, CFOs, uh, members of parliament, legislatures and councils, etc. and the executive. I'm not referring only to those. I'm referring to um, you know, average ordinary employees of the state. We do not have anyone in the state as South Africans. It may sound like an exaggeration, but we don't have anyone that we can rely on to basically protect and defend our rights, whether it be human rights, economic rights, and all um, aspects of social rights, social justice and economic justice rights that we have, not only as citizens of South Africa, but as human beings um, who happen to be citizens of South Africa. And so um, it's not a question of whether we should be concerned, it's a question of how much further can we tolerate the strain of deep insecurity of being a South African citizen um, and just not knowing, you know, what each day brings. Um, if it's not violence in the streets, uh, organized uh, lootings and attempts at, at overthrowing the state, like we saw in 2021, um, insecurity in electricity. We all know how important lights are, especially for women. Many women work long hours. They leave home before the sun rises and get home long after the sun is set. Not having lights is a massive security issue. Uh, not knowing whether or not we're going to have water um, over and above the rampant corruption, um, stealing and outright looting um, that we see happening across the South African government, of course, in, in cohorts with the private sector. Um, all of these are, are, are really just causing immense trauma for South Africans over and above the post-traumatic uh, stress disorder that we already suffer, especially as black people overall, and specifically females in general, um, of, you know, resulting from the post-apartheid colonial state that we come from. Mandisa, how would you respond to those who say what is happening happens, of course, with the tacit approval of the South African uh, nation and the electorate at large? Yes, naturally, we need to admit um, and you need to look at very few practical day to day examples to see what I'm saying. We need to admit as South Africans that we are generally a very corrupt society. Um, I mean, I always make an example of 
um, situations in the townships that, that happen very often and are very common. And I'm not isolating or naming and shaming the townships. Of course, I uh, partly come from township and rural areas in terms of my upbringing. But we need to look at be behaviors of human beings in communities that basically allow and encourage corruption um, by not acting against it boldly. Uh, and basically participating in, um, you know, in community mass corruption, such as buying goods um, that have been stolen, buying vehicles that have been hijacked at gunpoint and often, uh, you know, victims have been killed and raped, etc. Buying clothing from people who have literally clothing, stolen the clothing off somebody else's washing line from the same area. And I'm making very simple examples. And so, yes, of course, um, Generally, I mean, you, you will hear in the as an entrepreneur, um, you'll often come across um, people offering you very dodgy, you know, deals, and in a very laissez-faire sort of, you know, normal, ordinary way, as though this is the normal way of doing business. I have often had people tell me that, oh, you're going to die poor, you'll never make money because you're a purist. Um, you're always looking out for others. I've been told in corporate before by a boss of mine, a CEO that I was reporting to, that, oh, you know, this activist mentality of yours is going to land you up in poverty. Um, even as a female, you would get told very often that, oh, if you don't want to succumb to the rule of a man and you refuse to get married, you know, you'll have a miserable, lonely existence, etc. Now, society in South Africa is complicit in all this corruption that we see, because like I said, this corruption involves private individuals. Um, of course, there's a very deeply um, toxic and almost psychopathic relationship, you know, between, like I said, in the government context, government officials, the leaders in government, executives in government, the politicians, of course, being the most toxic of all, um, engendered and emboldened by an electoral act which remains unconstitutional and doesn't allow um, any societal oversight over government planning, spatial planning, government expenditure, uh, financial governance, etc. And so, yes, having also inherited a colonial apartheid past, uh, has an impact on our existence today. I mean, one doesn't want to be stuck in the past and you shouldn't. However, it's a grave mistake not to look at the past, learn from its mistakes and, um, you know, carve a way forward with society based on joint uh, societal values. Mm. Others might argue that we're going through a massive change. As usual, change is a constant in the world and the entire universe. The cosmos is about change. Nature is about change. Our bodies change. Seasons change. Everything changes. We grow older every second, every minute, every day. And so, yes, of course, there's that constant element that we may have also missed the boat and the train of proper mm. change management in order to decide what are the joint common values that we want in South Africa and what are the ills that we want to make sure we never, ever repeat. Mm. And I'm not sure whether the space uh, exists for us to have uh, those uh, type of conversations in any meaningful way at the moment. Uh, I may be wrong. But uh, Guru Kali, let me bring you in here. Uh, if we look now uh, from what Mandisa has said, and we are talking now about the deputy president of the country, we see the media writing at length about uh, very serious allegations uh, that uh, include, of course, allegations uh, of uh, some something like a girlfriend allowance of 500,000 Rand, uh, among other things. You know, you look at this, it raises the question because again, it's not the first time we've uh, read of such allegations, but it raises questions of, for example, how and why um, would our leaders be spending so much money? Where does this money come from for them to be able to uh, basically uh, grant these allowances uh, to those whom they so wish to dole it out to. But the further question is, what would or how would a normally functioning society or country do in the face of such allegations? And where the money comes from, it comes from the taxpayers. I think uh, uh, most South African taxpayers are very aware of that. Um, 
The allegations themselves, the details of it, um, a brother-in-law, an Edward Sony deal, the corruption, um, this is very content-based. We can switch the name from a Paul Mashkitile to a Zuma. We can keep the titles of son-in-law or, um, or a son and the corruption. The numbers may change, but the content um, is the same. The context is the corruption, the deep-seated corruption that the behavior of the politicians are operating with absolute impunity to do whatever they want, whenever they want, and to do it with disregard for the safety of the citizens. Corruption, I believe we see, and corruption allegations um, internationally, um, whether it's a, uh, a Hunter Biden Ukraine deal that, uh, you know, we can put on our tinfoil hats and say that um, Madiba received a briefcase. We can look at the behavior of British politicians um, having parties during global lockdowns. Um, yet internationally, or not all over the world, but in certain countries where citizens still feel a sense of safety to be themselves, safety within their environment, safety to be themselves uh, within their own bodies, um, is that there is a balance um, in the state providing uh, a conducive environment. Locally, the cost of a life is what, 500 Rand? Um, and whether the perpetrators are people from previously disadvantaged or currently disadvantaged societies just looking for um, a little bit of money to feed their family or the perpetrators are savages of blue light magezas who um, stamp on citizens' faces is that the violence and the savagery has taken new heights. Um, the manner in which uh, the corruption is perpetrated um, is for sure a concern for citizens of South Africa, but unfortunately not a surprise anymore. Mm. But but if we look at all of this, uh, again, you know, we're looking at the deputy president of the country, uh, all things being equal, someone who uh, would possibly assume uh, the position of president, uh, you know, when, as I say, all things are being equal as they have played out previously, hypothetically speaking. But then you have Figile Mbalula, for example, uh, reportedly saying the stories against Mashatile are just stories without evidence. And yes, uh, the veracity of this has to be tested. Uh, Mashatile himself saying that there's a plot to oust him. But is there something to be investigated around the deputy president? But then why just him and not others, as you've mentioned, other names? And as I say, these stories have been well documented, uh, Guru Kali. Um, for me, if it takes uh, the headline in that manner in our current context of the country is that uh, perhaps we're operating on triage. The list of corrupt politicians, um, as I said, it's content. We can change the name Paul Mashitile to corrupt politician number 7,826. Um, it's, it just happens to be the most pressing matter as he will be put into the most powerful and influential seat in South Africa um, if uh, his allegations are not dealt with first. Uh, yet contextually is that all of the corruption does need to be resolved in order for South Africa to find its feet again. But are we able to do that, Bandisa? Looking at just how endemic corruption has become in South African society, as you mentioned earlier, it's not just about government and uh, leaders of society. It is amongst us as well as ordinary South Africans. How do we deal with corruption as a nation? So of course it's a very complex issue, but there's always an easy place to start. And the easy place to start is who bears the most responsibility in relation to whatever constitutional imperatives um, that relate to security, um, safety, and just the general well-being of South Africans. That's the criminal justice system. 
um, beyond all other aspects of society and our own responsibility as citizens and human beings to ourselves to make sure that we respect ourselves, respect one another, and like I said earlier, have some common sense of value system that we can hold on to to say, look, this is how we uphold our, I mean, how we check ourselves in relation to how we behave to each other to give effect to that common respect and those common values. We have the criminal justice system whose core responsibility is to maintain the rule of law. Now, we all know, and this is a very horrific thing to say, but we all, I know, <laughs> as, as, as somebody who has been very active in anti-corruption work, and I continue to be active in anti-corruption work, and have suffered dearly. I mean, I've faced death threats. I've had police officers threaten me. I've had unknown people send death threats to me. And it's a wonder I'm even still alive. But um, we all know that the South African criminal justice system from A to Z, all agencies of uh, the state are completely, completely rudderless. Not only are they rudderless, like I said earlier, we have a, a political system in South Africa that is governed by an mm. electoral act, which is unconstitutional, which also makes it impossible for citizens, including NGOs, to hold anyone accountable in the state because of the electoral act and the mm. party list and the proportional representation system well. that has basically been taken from other countries and imposed on South Africa without any consideration for the unique um, setup of government that South Africa well. might need in order for it to build itself and rebuild itself to a functional society. Mandisa, we have to leave it there. But thank you so much. As I say, all this week we've been discussing a various aspect of leadership and a leadership crisis that we are faced with in the country.